Hi everybody, welcome to Will Alexander's Dog Show Tips, brought to you by Canine Chronicle TV. Today on the interview chair we have Gare Fleck Pedersen. So sit back and relax and listen to Gare for an hour or so. You had a great time. Hi everybody, today our special guest is Gare Fleck Peterson. How, Peterson, how are you, sir? I'm fine, thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> this interview scares me a little bit, but... Uh, uh, it can't scare you. We, we were chatting just before this and you were going on and on, and so you can't stop now, so... <laughs> <laughs> how, how's, the, how's the pandemic treating you? And the so far, from... good, actually. You know, I just spoke with some friends yesterday who have been in hospital. And, and um, so, but I'm staying in isolation. I'm bored to death. And, um, mm. but other than that, it's fine. You know, I think we are lucky to be alive and lucky to, to have a house to live in and have food and not have to worry about anything. Oh, exactly. So we have nothing to complain about. And what I hope is that the vaccine is um, happening very soon. Well, it's out there now. We just have to distribute it, so. Yeah, a lot of my Scandinavian friends and European friends have been lucky already and been oh. shot. So. Well, they're saying they should be able to get, what, up to 70% by September or something like that. So. That's my birthday, so that maybe that's when it's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and how's the winter treating you? I see your you know, I moved up here because of a uh, fire ant allergy that you might have heard about. So I had to uh, abandon Florida because I was um, in a three days uh, induced coma because of an um, anaphylaxic reaction, reaction to fire ants. And then I had one little incident after that. And then I thought, no, I'm not risking that. When I was told I had to stay within 10 minutes of an emergency room yeah. all the time, even with an EpiPen in my pocket. So... Uh, then I realized that Florida might not be for me. So, I like the winter, so. You do? I do, yeah, I do. I do. Yeah, I, I have like, a I like the four seasons, so. No, no, I don't mind sun and warmth. <laughs> All right. I'm Norwegian. I was used to snow. You know, I hated it. Oh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's start. Tell me how, you, how old you were and how you got started in the world of dogs. I got my first dog when I was seven years old. It was a mutt. We got her at three weeks old from my then girlfriend, Mikey, who was six. And they had a, a black bitch called Queenie that had uh, roamed around the town a little while and met somebody she liked very much. And she had a litter of four puppies. And when she was three weeks old, I got her. But that was on recommendation because I just before that, I had been bitten by a wild fox terrier. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and so I oh, had to change my, change my route to school every morning. And I was actually, for a while, scared of dogs. Oh, no. And some in my family wish I still was. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a wire fox terrier that bit you? That was a wire fox terrier. And, and uh, thinking about it back, you know, he was probably playing with me because he grabbed my heel oh, yeah. And, yeah. and my pants. And, and uh, so he was probably very harmless, but... Um, I was a frail little boy, so oh, for sure. I thought it was an attack. <laughs> <laughs> when did the world of purebred dogs start for you? Actually, I started... the bite of the wire fox terrier. No, the wire fox terrier. I mean, um, the ad, I happened to meet... Um, I went to, to a training classes with this mongrel, and uh, there I met a lot of people with different dogs and different breeds and particularly I there was a lady who had a boxer that she couldn't take care of couldn't handle him it was wild and wonderful and so I became his co-owner and um, he was the first dog I showed in 1959 when I was 12 years old it's amazing and, uh, excuse me a second sorry it's amazing how many interviews I've done people have started with boxers <laughs> Yeah, but I, I, I co-owned him. He didn't live with me, but I showed him and trained him and all that kind of stuff. And then um, 
when I was um, in busy with him, I also met another lady who had just become a widow, and she had a German shepherd whose name was Rex. And, and um, she couldn't, she needed help with him. So I took him to training classes at the, in the German Shepherd Club. Oh. And, and that is when I, I, so my interest in German Shepherd has existed. Both breeds have exist, existed for forever and ever, you know? So and I attended every German Shepherd club in Norway that I could probably attend. And the same with any boxer event that I could event, that could take part in. And, um, you know, I lived in Bergen. There were not that many dog shows there. So whether it was for sporting dogs or for, uh, we had a bag and sell cups and Bergson club, which was an all breed club. They had one annual dog show and we had one German shepherd dog show. Uh, and we had a, a, a gun dog club show. So these were basically the three or four dog show we had in Bergen. So when I got my first wire, that was in 1963 because then my parents wouldn't let me have Airedales. And because why, why Mr. No it, pardon? Why no Airedales? Why did your parents not because want? Because we lived in an apartment and they thought it was too big. Oh, okay. And it was also a, a, a weird thing because I, my mentor in Terriers was the lady I met through the club, through the dog club. And uh, I had seen a neighbor who had this big black and tan poodle looking thing full of hair one day. And the next day I saw it hairless. And I think, what the hell has happened to it? And they told me that it's trimmed. And I said, clip? No, no, it's they plucked them. And I thought, bloody hell, this is, thing, this is horrible. So um, uh, <laughs> when at the next meeting in our, our dog club, um, we were asked, um, the junior, or everybody in the junior section were asked if, if we had any special interest or something we would like to do. And I put my hand up and said, I would like to know how to, to pluck a terrier. And then Mrs. Nagelgaard, who was an other breeder, took me under her wings. And uh, she, re she was very kind. She reorganized her grooming schedule so that, um, because she only groomed dogs she bred herself. But so instead of doing them in the morning, she did them after my school hours a couple of times a week. Okay. And uh, I sat there on a stool from, I was 12 years at the time, so for two years without, before she gave me a stripping knife. And she wouldn't let me strip an air there first. I was, you know, the first breed I trimmed totally was a giant schnauzer. Oh, wow. And that happened also be, to be a couple of years later, the first dog I ever won a group with. So, so um, and that's also a breed that has been close to my heart ever since. And I showed a lot of them in, in Norway, and I even made up my own English champion when we lived in England. They're very striking. I watched you judge them a couple of years ago in Florida, and it was a lot of fun to watch you judge them. Yeah, I love the breed. And it's probably, it's, that is probably my favorite breed. I mean, oh, really? you know, yeah, I, I think, uh, uh, we have our dog, um, his registered name was champion Paris Garden William. And um, he was wonderful when he was around you. But when he was in his run, he was a tiger. So everybody thought he was nasty. And his pet name was George. And everybody thought he was named by George, after George Wall. <laughs> and I said, no. <laughs> so, uh, but he was a great dog. And... Um, so we, uh, the Wire Fox Terriers. When did they start? Then they started. I bought my for Lady Lou, who is the foundation. She was the foundation. It started in 1963. Mm -hmm. I had a friend who had a um, dog called Teddy, and she was bred to a, a bitch called Ginny. And um, I got the runt of the litter. And um, we had another early, very prolific early breeder in Norway who. Um, happened to come to visit Bergen to go to a dog show. And she looked at this little thing and she said to me, do you know you can shape this dog to become something? And, and I said, what do you mean? Yeah, you put it on the table every day, you put it in the shape you want it to look, you put the, put the tail in, you, you, and then you walk it and try to get the same attitude and, and uh, on, on the move as you have on the table. And that's what I did with this little thing. So she never won much, but she became the mother of my first champion. And, and um, um, then I realized after two generations that why should I start up at this level when I could buy for very little money, a huge progress and move forward. Mm -hmm. 
So that that was what happened a few years later. Well, tell us about that. Who did you buy from first? The first, uh, that's funny because I, I bought, I had an, I, co I worked with a lady called Orsa Tofton and we also worked with um, a Danish guy called Bengt uh, Smith and he imported a lot of dogs from St. Erm in England and from uh, Cademan and, and, and other famous kennels and uh, also Welsh Terriers from Kedwain and um, so um, those were the ones I then started with but I really restarted again in Royal Fox Terriers in 1974 when I married uh, Jörd Ohm, who was already a well-established cocker breeder. And you know, I bred cockers for many years before that. And, and um, she didn't want me in the cocker ring, so, so, so she initiated that. I, even if I brought a few wires with me, she, she said, you know, you should take her wires again. So I went to, to um, Joe Cartledge and um, Visit the lace and the first pitch I bought again was the one called La Laven Lacy Girl. And what was really annoying was that I tried initially to buy her sire. And that sire I missed by two days. And his name was C Wire Elsewire Marksman. And he was purchased by Pam Running in Canada. Oh, okay, yeah. Yes, <laughs> and, and, but I I got this daughter by him. So, um, but so I kept in touch with Pam Running for a few years after that, and he produced some good stuff for her. Yeah, she had some good dogs for a while there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there are Canadian connections. Yes. <laughs> yes, we had another. Um, we talked earlier about uh, Newt Egberg. Yeah, um, he was a great guy. You know. Uh, rather disorganized but but he was a great dog man yeah and and when i decided that uh, it was decided for me that i couldn't uh, have airedales because of the size i tried to buy uh, a carry from him and he had two puppies at the time and um, he asked 250 norwegian kronos which is probably like 40 us dollars or something for the puppy at the time and i said just give me two weeks to, to um, save up this money, get this money together. I was 12 years old at the time or something. Right? Yeah. And uh, so when I finally called him to tell him that he can send the dog now, well, I, have, I have the money. He said, oh, I'm sorry, I sold him yesterday. Oh. So, then, <laughs> so then I bought this wild bitch lady and the rest is history. You know? mm -hmm. What's the history we want to know about? So you can't, you can't just push over it like that. I want to know everything here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, so, no, I have no, I have no secrets, no. And no, then I bred wires for, for, you know, and I, I kept uh, some of my old stock when I moved to Sweden in 1975. I bought them with me veterans and stuff, so I had a continuous line from them, but, but I restarted all together in, 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 in Sweden. And, what did you, uh, did you start with? Where did, what kennels did you start with in Sweden? Well, that was the Laven Lacy girl that I just mentioned, who okay. was by Steve Ailes or Marksman. And then, and the other foundation bitch that I bought was a girl from, I tried to buy a dog called Harville Huntsman from England, who won Best in Show at Crafts later. And Peter Green was also after him. And, and uh, any, any person who had common sense would try to buy that dog. And um, he was... Um, lovely and you know he was bred and owned by Evelyn House who lived in the middle of London or, or rather on Harrow or the Hill in a little tiny backyard but she had something like 30 or 40 dogs there at times and she also bred I think uh, apricot poodles to support the wires for a while but but and I knew that if I bought dogs from her they would have to have a decent temperament in addition to and they had wonderful temperament and and uh, they had brought with them some problems that I had to breed up later, but um, I had a lot to, I bought three dogs from her all together, I think, yeah. And you, sh you showed a lot of dogs as well, like I, I've seen pictures of Lakelands and obviously wires. Well, I, the, the Lakeland was uh, a gift from Mrs. Howard, she was Peter's client, you, you remember uh, Carlotta Howard, so mm -hmm. that was a huge Peter client for many years. And uh, actually it was my wife who fell in love with Brassy. Okay. Um, and um, so we got her to Sweden and um, she did tremendously well because she won 
I think the groups and, and several Terry groups in, after she came to Sweden, and then she went best in show at the Skansen show, which is the, um, all the, similar to the or, or Montgomery here. She won that, and runner-up was more, my wife was shown the lake, and I was runner-up with a wire, and I was really pissed off. But but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that was good. That she was so thrilled because. A couple of weeks, no, the year earlier, the year before, we actually showed um, in Helsinki in Finland, and I went best in show with a wire fox terrier, and uh, my wife was runner up with a cocker out of 4,000 dogs. Oh, wow. And she would never forgive me that, you know. So, um, but after this uh, Skansen show, she finally decided that she had had her revenge. <laughs> so Brassy was basically hers, and, and uh, she also won, um, she became an English champion. First she went in through quarantine to come to Sweden, then she was one of the 35 dogs we took with us and put in quarantine when we moved to England. And what year then did you move to England? Pardon? What year did you move to England? 1983. We, we bought a company over there called Scandia Trailers, and... and um, I was able to work from home, and, and um, so we, and we bought a farm outside London where we had loads and loads of American visitors, I can tell you. We had, uh, if you read our guest book, it's just reading like who is who in, in the dog world, which yeah, is okay. fantastic. Oh, exactly. Hmm? That'd be exciting. Now, I see trophies over your shoulder. What's the, what trophy is that? That is the trophies you see there, Yeah. if you see them all. No, the, one, the, one, the, the horrible one in the center with a piece of wood below it, underneath it is um, the Norwegian dog of the year. And the one to the or side of them are the Swedish dog of the year. And um, we call the golden dogs, the golden dog. And, and um, I was the first in history to win dog of the year, both in Norway and Sweden. With which dog? Same year. That was an import black tail dog, black tail Starbright, that I bought from Harry Odonia. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the other side is the second one that I... Uh, no, the first one was the Welsh Terrier, a dog called Deborah Janor, who was also Nordic dog of the year. He won Best in Show in all Scandinavian countries and, and uh, won more Best in Show in one year, I think, than any dog had done until then. Wow. And, um, but then he repeated, and he was the first to do it, and then I did it again with, with Star Wars. So I didn't breed any of them, but uh, it's so funny because when I, I first saw Starbright at Crufts with, with um, Harry O'Donoghue. I saw this dog standing in there. So I went, ran over to my friends and said, come on here, you have to look at this dog. And, and um, they all come over. I don't want to mention them by name because it's kind of embarrassing. And uh, because they came to the ringside and said, which one? And for me, it was only this one Obviously. dog in there standing with one, cor with one leg in each corner and looking fan fantastic. I was never able to get a collar back on him that um, he had that day, but um, I eventually got to buy him, and um, uh, he produced a lot of. He, he t temperament was his strongest side. He, he gave us a lot of winners, but but also a few problems. So. Um, oh, okay. So what other trophies do you have there? I see there's lots of stuff behind you. So. If you turn that way, can uh, you see all oh, those? Oh yeah. <laughs> those are my best in show at the, at the Swedish Terror Club shows. Now, I think wow. there are 22 of them on that shelf, and there are some missing. But, but um, so, um, lots to brag about and think about now that we're getting old. <laughs> so, who, who do you consider your mentors in the sport then, Gary? Well, I'm, I'm, it's so difficult because my original mentor on my inaugural goal was the other breeder that took me under her wing. Mm -hmm. And then from then, I moved, uh, I, when I started in Wires, I was constantly in touch with uh, Mrs. Bergendahl in Oslo. I still remember her old telephone number, 535329. <laughs> <laughs> That's only 50 years ago or something. <laughs> and and um, then from then it became... Uh, Ernie Sharp, and from then on it became Rick and Peter and George, and you know, and when uh, so I learned from them along the way. And, and um, my dream was for many years to be able to go to America and, and uh, show dogs. When did and you first come to America then? 
the first time I was in America was actually West, Westminster, 1979. Okay. So, um, were you showing or? No, no, no. I was just, we were just, um, just visiting, just watching. Visiting. Yeah, but I loved it. And on that trip, that's the last time I smoked because we had such a horrible flight back to Scandinavia. And I thought, if these wings stay on this plane all the way to, to, to Copenhagen, You'll quit smoking. I'm, I'm quit smoking, and I did. <laughs> good, good for you. Yeah. <laughs> so, how many times you wanted you wanted to show dogs in America? When was the first time you showed a dog in America? Then? I do know. I hardly ever. I won uh, best of breed at Westminster, 1982, with a, a dog that Peter had over here that showed for me. And uh, but I never showed many dogs over here. I helped George occasionally. You know, we spent a lot of summers with George. Everybody thought he uh, you know, was such a bad loser and stuff, which he probably was in, to a certain extent, but he was so wonderful to us and the family. And you know, he showed a lot of dogs that I shipped over here to him, mm -hmm. and Ross did too. And, and um, so we spent a number of summers in Constantine, Michigan, and at Mackinac Island. Well, I loved Constantine. A fabulous mass of family. Yeah. He was, he was raised just down the road from here, Oakville, Ontario. That's yeah. Where my dad was. He used to have, a, I had a, my first kennel was on the fifth line, and George would tell me he used to ride his bike by it to go fishing. So I'd hear mm -hmm. the stories. Yeah, no, he, he was still a biker when I met him. You know, he loved his bike, and he kept in great shape. You know, he used his trampoline, and he, and he, um, he uh, played golf as often as he possibly could. Yeah. Sure. He's the only person I know that has been, been beaten by a blind golfer, but that is a different story. <laughs> we were, Peter Green and Tommy Grubb, you can erase this if you want later. Oh, no, it's good it's stuff. Story. Tommy Glassford, Peter Green, and, and, and um, George Warburg and Ross were staying with us in, in England. And I got a phone call this morning from a, a guy that I covered played golf on a regular basis called Derek Sheridan. He was legally blind, but he was, you know, he could see partly. So um, he said, Gary, I missed three players. We have the Blinders Golf Associations at Aspect Park today. Do you think you could, um, could find somebody to come up? I said, I have two golfers here, Tommy and George, and uh, I will actually, um, we, if you can take all three of us, we, we will come, otherwise I can't do it. And Peter walked around with us anyway. So we come up there and we were all given uh, an, a, an opponent, a blind golfer in our team. And so we, I went to one, I think Tommy went out first, then I did go. And third was George. And just before I tee off, I heard George go up to this guy saying, why don't we make this a little more interesting? He said, what, what about a side bet? And the guy said, yes, sir, that's okay. And, and, you know, he had his wife with him as a, as a guide. So, and um, what do you say about five pounds front, five pounds back and five pounds overall? So for 15 pounds altogether, is that okay? The proper Englishman said to him, yeah, that's fine, George. And everything went fine. We went in and I can't remember the results, but Bob, Nate, Tommy and I and Peter were in the bar. And in the door comes Mr. Wall, the smoke coming out of both ears. And uh, I said to him, what happened? Don't tell me you lost to that blind man. And he said, he was fucking blind. <laughs> <laughs> I should have noticed on the first tee, he asked his wife, where should I aim? And she pointed at the tree 300 yards up the fairway. <laughs> so whenever we played golf after that, and George was in, um, in the process of beating me, I just mentioned that, you know, George, I had a friend was beaten by a blind golfer and that made him so angry you know it was amazing so um but we had a lot of fun we had a lot of fun on the golf course and, and um, yeah so he was the one who introduced me to golf actually because they all played golf yes because you know, they all played golf on Mackinac island during the dog days way yeah, out there i was there once yeah and and i was there every year for a number of years and and um um, one year he said to me, why don't you go back to England and have some lessons and come back here? So I rang up a friend of mine who I knew owned a golf course and said, how do I get golf lessons? She'd never have done that. I was hooked for years and years and years. <laughs> then I, 
and then I cheated a little bit because we had a side, I can't remember where the side bet was, but I, I didn't make the dead timeline, but I lied to him, so I got my money. But, but um, and then um, next year we come back to Mackinac, and Eric, my son, had had golf lessons at the same time. And uh, he tees off and I tee off and George turns around to me and said, why the F don't you have, didn't you have a lesson from the same guy who taught him? <laughs> So anyway, that was fun. And, and you know, that brought us together. We made me the friendship with Bob and Jane and, and all these other Cappy, um, you know, Michelle Billings' husband and, and a lot of other the nicest people in the world. When you have oh, yes. wow. We were just as competitive on the golf course as they were on the... Oh, I, I know. When my, my first wife and I, Allison, went to Dog Days. George got us up there. And... The first day, we didn't golf. You don't need one of us to golf. So we stayed in, we actually stayed inside with Ricky. Ricky was in there. So um, they played. And the I guess the first day, George's team won. And then the set, then they started betting money. And Janie's team won when they bet. When they, when they started mm -hmm. betting money. So oh, yeah. Well, and then you had, of course, you had a lot of other people up there. You had Gene Heath, who was just as competitive as... Um, <laughs> most of us and um for some funny reason peter nay george hated losing to her but uh, he hated losing to anybody so that didn't matter <laughs> but he was but he did a fan i mean the way he to watch him grooming a dog and go over the coat and all the cars was a fantastic experience oh, you know yeah whenever i go to michigan he would uh he'd come over and see whatever gun dog i was showing and he, he was he was spot on everything he said, and he would he would even tell me certain things I should change on it. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. He was yeah, you know he is, he, is, he I, in my opinion he was much nicer than he was given credit for. But yeah, of I course mean, he wanted he wanted to own Michigan and and um, you know Indiana and these areas that he showed dogs in all the time. So, but um, we used to like the longest be, time we his we drive by his dad's kennel and the runs were like, there, there, you could still see the remnants of the kennel it's gone really? now, but you could see mm -hmm. it in the QEW as you drove by the, the, where Ted Ward's kennel was our trophy up here is the Ted Ward trophy still so yeah carrier breeders yeah that's good yeah okay so we got a bit off track there that's okay yeah 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 you can erase that <laughs> no no I like that stuff that's, that's, that's the thing that people want to hear um, so you were when did you start judging then, Gare? I I started judging at open show level in the some uh, seventy something I can't remember and uh, did a lot of breed shows and open shows in England and then after we moved to England I started judging. Uh, but you know I've never been a um, judging has never been my main ambition. I love the breeding and showing thing mm -hmm. and raising puppies and training puppies. So um, and and I think it's. Um, I know it's very um, un-American right now to say this, but I think um, I want to know what I'm doing, you know? Even in my own briefs, you come across things at times that you wonder what, how we're going to deal with it, you know? And, and, um, but, but um, you know, we grew up in a world, um, for instance, when it comes to breeding dogs, that in, in terriers, in wild fox terriers, we didn't know how to fix anything or do anything. We bred them, you know, the ones who had something wrong with their ears or their tails or anything else, they went as pets. And then, so we, they were selective breeding. And, and uh, I'm so proud of the fact that the last probably five, six generations I bred, didn't, you didn't even have to set the ears, you know, you just kept them natural. And, and um, I mean, think to prove, I'm so happy that, so many of my dogs are still in pedigrees around the world because they were what you saw. While in fox terriers, there was a lot of fixing and minor and larger operations all the time. So um, it was um, it was more of a challenge, but it was you also felt that you deserved what you, you what you achieved. Right? Sure. You see what I mean? Well, yes, I remember blind dogs in Canada being shown. At some that, that Pemberton dog was here for a while, it's Sonia. No, you had a dog. I sold two dogs to Canada, but probably... Um, did Sonia buy them bit. both? Pardon? Did Sonia Sparling buy them both? Yeah, but she bought first one dog called Pinnacle, and then... So I showed um, one of them for her. Yeah, that was probably Peabody. And, and uh, Peabody 
was the one she had as a replacement because I think um, she had an accident and he was killed, the first one, Pinnacle. Mm -hmm. And uh, he won a few best in shows in Canada with her handling. And then um, Peabody, she, she, well, I can't remember what she called me or cried or she was very, very upset. So I sent her a dog that I had intended to keep myself. And um, from a very, very successful litter, actually, you know, um, his brother was the first dog that, um, called Lulan Peterman, that, that um, Gabriel showed and did a lot of winning with, the first Wire Fox Terrier, owned by Kathy Regis. Well, that was and, the great to Sonia's dog then? Um, that was Little Major to Sonia's dog? Yes, yes, it was Little Major Sonia's dog. And then the Bismarck Keller Kennel, who's a huge kennel in Germany, they had a third brother who also had been produced a lot, a lot of good stuff. Wow. So um, um, that was. Um, so I don't know. And then he was sold to some person in, in America, a talking Peabody, and, and he ended up with, uh, with Dennis Sprung. Oh. Dennis Springer. Dennis Springer, okay. Not Dennis Sprung. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it's so difficult for me to keep these names apart. And, and, um, so, and then he did a little bit of winning and a few people used him, but, uh, he more or less disappeared from the scene. Okay. I, I yeah, I should call Bouvier's for Sonia and the, the one wire dog I can't, I can't remember anything else. Um, but she's still Which around. I, What's that? Least, I, but I was told that she sold him because she was terminally ill with cancer or something. So I thought she wasn't around anymore. Oh, no, she's and that still is, around. Yeah, so I, I think Luke told me that actually. Yes. Okay. Can yeah, I think it? Luke showed for her as well. Yeah, he showed the Peabody dog, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Um, and when did you when did you move to to America? What year? Well, I moved in two thousand and five in November. Okay. And um, with um, um, only a couple of whippets. Four, no, four whippers, I think, we brought with us. So, But my son studied here for all these years. And first he went to Denver, University of Denver, and then he went to Stanford, and where he met this fabulous girl that he is married to, and the reason why he lives in Cleveland and why I'm in Ohio right now. <laughs> where, and, exactly, uh, where exactly in Ohio are you? I'm in Pepper Pike, which is um, just maybe 10 miles outside Cleveland. Oh, okay. You, yeah, you get snow. <laughs> so, yeah. what about um, what would be the the funny things that happened to you in the ring? Do you remember any, anything that's happened to you in the ring? Well, the most embarrassing thing that happened to me in the ring was in the late sixties, I think it was. I was showing um, an air day in Kristiansand in Norway, and we had a um, um, judge in Norway called the very prim and proper guy called Tore Edmund. He um, suffered from alopecia and, uh, and so he hadn't, but he always had his fabulous wig on. And when he bent down to, to um, look at her teeth, she looked up and she jumped up and grabbed his wig. <laughs> I could tell that was coming. <laughs> and, uh, and, but that was not, she actually won the breed, but, but, but uh, he, just very embarrassed, put the wig back on, back to front. And you know, so um, that, that was the most embarrassing thing that he, uh, I embarrassed him, you know, in, in a way. But other than that, there's not been a lot of... Um, what about when you're judging? Do you have, any, have you had any funny things happen when you're judging? Oh, yes. I mean, but my favorite story is actually one that I keep telling everybody is, uh, when we first moved to England, I judged an open show and I, in Surrey. And um, in a big cl open class, any variety, I placed a standard poodle second. And um, I happen to know the lady and I have to know that, um, who she was and, and all that kind of stuff. So being Scandinavian, I was stupid enough to go up because, you know, we always have to explain what we do. So I told her about it. It, it. The bitch was nice and she was very attractive and but maybe she could have a little better feet and a little better tail set. 
But um, other than that, she was lovely. And whereupon she looks at me and she said, well, Mr. Pedersen, you're not exactly an oil painting yourself. Oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> so that is, um, but, but yeah, there has been a lot of little things people have said and all the kind of stuff. But normally, you know, I, one thing that I can't understand is people are so sensitive about things right, yeah. over here compared to, you know, we don't have any field reps. So we don't have, and normally the things that happen in the ring, if there's anything to complain about, we have to go back home and then you have to write a letter and in, include a check over the X amount of money. And so when you come to that point, you just forget about it. And That's the same it. up here. We have no field yeah, reps. Yeah. yeah. So, so it, it's kind of, um, and I, but I think a lot of these stories have been very funny, you know, and, and um, exactly. so we've, and we've had so, so many, my, my favorite story is one Andrew Grace used to tell us from England, what uh, this, this Dexon ladies who, she went to the same show week after week after week and the same lady won every class. And, and um, finally she came to a dojo where the judge reversed the placing. And she went up to me and she said, congratulations, darling. But I must admit, I never knew your dog was co-hopped, but I've never seen him from this angle before. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so that, that is fantastic. But you know, breeding dogs, I think we should talk a little about breeding dogs, how much, how clever we are and, and how much um, luck comes into it. Um, I was fortunate enough to, to buy a couple of bitches from a lady called Miss Elsie Williams, who also write, wrote a book about the wild fox terrier. And um, I talked her, I bought first one bitch from her, and then I talked her into breeding um, her champion bitch to gals of excellence, you know. Yeah. And um, But she was 90 years old or something at the time, so she said that, well, if I can't take care of the puppies, you have to take them. I said, I'll, I'll take them. So we went down to, to Devon, where she lived, and, and uh, looked at the lister, and we picked up the dewey hunter. And then, um, and that, that litter is, it was that bitch we picked from that litter, who became, I gave her to my mentor in Norway later on, she became an English champion, and she, I, put, I had three litters from her. And then, uh, because I would never, if I could avoid it, let any dog, have to live their entire life in a kennel. I would like them to have a life. Mm -hmm. I gave her to Mrs. Bergendahl, my mentor in Norway, where she slept on the bed for many years. And um, she also became dog of the year in Norway at five, six years old. And, uh, but she is the mother of these dogs, Peabody and, and um, Pacific and, 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 and uh, Peterman that we talked about earlier on. Yes, okay. So, um, and, and the, other the other one, and, and uh, the reason I picked her was that my son dropped her on the floor. <laughs> and she's the only one in that litter who has made any mark in any fox terrier history. And she is in basically every, um, why well, fox terrier pedigree, I think, if you go far enough back. Wow. They have today. And the funny thing was that <laughs> Mrs. Williams, it was very, when I came down there to, to look at that litter and I picked these two, I picked the dog in a bit. Um, she said, um, I will call you in a couple of days if I can't manage this. So she called me out for two, two days and said, Mr. Peterson, you have to come down and get these puppies. I can't come down. I said, but you can send them up. So she sent them up and um, I picked them up at the station and um, we were, then the next day come a telephone call. I haven't got any money from you yet. I said I wasn't going to buy them. I was going to sell them for you. Well, in, in just the same day, we had this couple coming along and, and um, they wanted one of the puppies. And we just going to have, make sure it had all the vet papers, papers and all the stuff we wanted them to have before they went. So they were coming back the next day. So two days later, I got a phone call from Mrs. Williams. Um, you have to send the puppies back. I want them back. So we, I said, yeah, but I sold one of them. I don't care. She said, I want them back. So we had to let these people have Trixie, the one that we um, later became such a famous brood. 
Oh, wow. So, so off she went. Three months later, I sit having breakfast with my wife, and I said, do you know what? I, I'm going to check up on Trixie and see what's happening to her. I called a number to these people, and the mother lifts the phone and said, oh, she cried, because her daughter had been seriously injured in a car accident the day before. And they were just going to put an ad in the local paper to sell the bit. Get rid of Trixie, oh, jeez. Yeah, Trixie, yes. And, and I was lucky enough to have some people, some wild folks, other people that bought dogs from me and show dogs uh, nearby. And I said, grab a bunch of cash and go and get her. So they did that. So, so then she came back to us. And if you ever see a picture of a wild fox tear on a stamp from Monaco, that's Trixie. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. She was almost placed in a home. But he... Yes, she was sold and came back. And all these things that happened to her is, is um, what makes this so wonderful. And, and the other, I have another dog, a dog called Lunai Pickle Pepper. He was in virtually every pedigree. He was the grandsire of the litter she, she produced with Pacific and all the stuff. Is. And uh, he was... Rick Sashurdin, remember him? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah he, can, he stayed with us a number of times. And, and um, I introduced him to a dog. We took him down to, to, to um, Joe Kill Kennels where Mary Swash. Mm -hmm. She was handling a dog called the Silea Special Edition. And, George. Uh, George. So when had, because he had an Airedale then that was top Airedale in the country here right then. And I said, you won't see Mary's Airedale. And so, so we went down there and... and uh, so I said, show him George. And he went bananas. And, and um, so he bought him. And, and, um, but then, so we took him home to, to Lambridge from Crufts, where we lived. This is so a special edition, George. Third special You're edition, different. yes. I had first refusal on him. And, and, um, but, but so he came to Lambridge Farm. And, and um, we had this little bitch called uh, another panda bitch, panda picturesque. He was in season, and I had used George before, and I was very unhappy with the coats. And um, so, but my wife talked me into using him, and that produced this little dog called Pig, Panda, uh, Blue Line Pickled Pepper, who um, everybody loved, and who did. He didn't do all that much winning, but he was everybody used him. He was type personified, you know. Yeah. And when he was a little boy, he was. Um, I was thinking about selling him because he was so heavily marked. And then uh, Peter's wife, Gaynor, come along and she said, you can't do that, he's so lovely. And um, so we kept him. <laughs> but I take all credit for all this, you know. So that <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, you know, it's a lot of thing happening in your life. And then, do you think you can say whatever happened? I trimmed the dogs and I groomed them, I showed them and I trained them and, and did all, all of you, you know. But uh, a lot of it happens because there's some kind of luck in the world. Oh, there's no question. There's no qu luck and timing, there's no question. Yeah, we had a, another very um, exciting story was we, when we had this whippet bitch that we got, a, you know, we bought a couple of dogs from a guy called Bo Bengtson, you know him? Yes. Yes. <laughs> in ca uh, and... Um, Pinza and Lanza, and Mario and Lanza was their names. And um, we, even, we brought males because you never want to breed it or breed whippets because we had greyhounds, we had fox terriers, we had English cockers. So anyway, this lady, uh, Pip Campbell, who had me crowned here, brought a champion bitch to him. And we had a bitch called Mithrande Sweet Soprano. I told her that. And just when we were going back to Sweden, she was in season. And we had come back from Crufts early uh, because we were in the middle of moving more or less. And, and um, so we watched Best in Show on, on the, um, television. So I said to my wife, before we go, even if we have to make a trip to Scotland, we should breed to this dog. And um, so we did. So we call, I called up Maura Bolton around him and, and she said, do you know, Gear? I'm coming to London tomorrow for a charity thing, you know, of being on television. So we met at Heathrow Airport and 
spread a bit um, behind some cars there. And uh, then, uh, of course, nine weeks later, she had a litter of five. And that's the best whippet litter we ever bred. And when you think about how things fall into place, you think this is meant to be. Oh, exactly. Yeah. That's and um, all, all five puppies in that litter became champions. And um, one of them that went to Norway to Arne Foss, have you met him? Who? Arne Foss. No, no. He's a Norwegian all rounder, the nicest guy you should ever bring to Scotland. Um, he had had one of the puppies and from her he bred a bitch that became dog of the year in Norway a couple of years later. So um, sometimes you have luck. Cockers? Pardon? What about your English cockers? You know we had a lot that was really brought, what brought us together because we, we met in the cocker ring and, and um, I spent more time in England with cocker breeders and, uh, than with any other breeders and, and um, my, I adopted a couple of parents in England called jo Joyce and George Caddy, whose books, they both wrote a book each, and I stayed there and traveled around the country and visited every single cocker kennel that I possibly could like, get into. And um, in 1972, I had a dog that became top gun dog in Norway, a sort of sporting dog. And, but we kept breeding dogs, and, and uh, then we had a lot of, and because I was into party colors when we met and, and uh, my wife was into solids more or less. So we then, when I started taking up wires on a more serious level, um, we focused more on the, the, the solids and bred some fantastic dogs over the years. So, um, but, but, um, what was I, their, pre what was their prefix? Prefix. Hubestad. Hubestad. H-U-B-B-E-S-T-A-D, which was also, um, the prefix for greyhounds and whippets, and I um, and Norfolk Terriers, you know, we won. Um, so we had had um, quite a successful run with greyhounds, more than whippets, I would say, and we bred some really nice ones. And um, that's how we got to know Max Magda and all these, you know. Oh, yes, he came to visit us many times in England, so um. Yeah, we miss him up here. He was a, he was a character up here. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, do you know he worked for IKEA for a while? I, I did know that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and his brother uh, designs furniture as well. So. It is? Okay. Paul. Yeah, been, yeah. Is it Paul? Paul Magda is his brother, I think. I think so. Um, I can't Paul remember. was his boyfriend, wasn't it? Yeah, Paul was. Boyfriend. Boyfriend. I, I think he also. Had, I, I think his brother's name was Paul. Because the, the lady I bought my second kennel from, Sally Rachulius, she was an English cocker person, and she used to brag about her Magda couch. I'm like, Max designed a couch? No, his brother Paul. I'm like, um. Mm. <laughs> so, no, but you know, I, I, you know I, I had a lot of love, but I, when, when I had, were mostly involved, involved in cockers before I got married, I was still working and trying to improve on my exams results so I could open doors again, you know. Dogs really screwed up my, my <laughs> marks for a little while. <laughs> so when I was 22, I think I went back to school for three years and studied a lot of different subjects and, and became a head hunter and personnel expert and all that kind of stuff. But um, I, I was leaning on a lot of friends to, to so that that I co-bred with and that they sh I showed the dogs for them. I imported their dogs and I co-bred their dogs. In some cases, but mainly I, I imported them and showed them for them, you know, and taught them how to groom dogs and, and all that kind of. Father, like you, you seem to have a, a vast array of talents of, of trimming and breeding and grooming. How did you learn it all? Did you, did you ever work for anybody or did you just... Uh, no, I never did actually. I, I actually uh, picked it up. I mean, the basic I was taught by my f mentor in, yes. in the other breeder. And the, the, cocker, the cocker grooming, I actually basically learned from watching. And then John Gillespie of Locranza fame. Yes, yes. Uh, became one of my very best friends and he was a fabulous groomer and he stayed with us in Sweden many times and, and uh, uh, taught me all about 
cocker trimming. You know, I, um, I, I could, I did it decently before, but I think he made me upgrade it. But then when I went to England, I was sitting, watching only sharp as much as I possibly could. And the funny thing was that the first time I showed to Peter Green, when he actually dumped me in this nearly every class, um, <laughs> Nothing to laugh at. It's bloody serious, man. And and uh, um, he, after I finished the last story, he came in and said, "Did you ever work for Ernie Sharp?" And I said, "No, I didn't." And he said, "Would you like a job?" And I said, "I don't need a job." And uh, but but anyway, he made it up. Well, Rick actually made it up later in the day because I won best in show with a Norfolk Terrier that my wife had bred. So. Uh, and then I forgave him, and uh, so, and the rest is history. We've been friends forever, so <laughs> I have forgiven him. But no oh, that's time. good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you basically learned just by watching people, then. Yes, and then, and then um, yeah, but, but uh, you know, in, and also I think the fact that. Uh, we in, in um, Scandinavia were up against a bunch of amateurs, you know. My grooming skills were so far superior to many of the other people there. While if I'd been in America, I would have been way down the line, you know. But, but uh, um, and I also had this thing that I admire so much with what the way Peter is grooming dogs. He made them look as though God made them that way. You know, if you see what I mean, it doesn't, they're not sculptured the mm -hmm. way that some other people do, that they look unnatural. I like them it's and they look as though they are, they are true to, to what, you know, as though they are created this way from the beginning. And, and um, so I learned a lot from Peter, I learned a lot from George, and learned Rick. But you know, Rick was more extreme, and for many years I loved his. The, 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 the extreme outline and all that kind of stuff. But I think as, as um, you get older and more sensible and more experienced, you realize the, you know, I love these overangulated things with long necks and, um, but you realize the more you learn about dogs, the more you realize that modification and, you know, is, is, is something to aim for more than the extreme in the end, when it comes to health and function and all that kind of stuff. Oh, for sure. Yeah. We, we get drawn to those fancy ones, but when you really yep. look at them. So, so if you, um, what advice would you give somebody if they were just starting out in dogs right now? You know, it's very difficult for me. I think that, um, start early. I think that this one, one of my arguments in life is people say, why are not, you not an all-rounder? Because I'm still learning about the breeds I, I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And and I have a lot of respect for breeds and breeders, and and um, but find a sound base to 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 find. A bit, if you're lucky, you'll find some. If you go through it, you you can find somebody like Peter Green or or even you know who are, have a serious attitude to all this and 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 uh, um, and or, or maybe even better a breeder who is really dedicated and and and. Um, know what they're doing and because it's not only about you know today it's too much about winning mm -hmm. i i personally um showed dogs for three or four years before i won anything at all you know because and i didn't expect to win you know because whether i was running around with a german shepherd or with an english setter or with an english cocker there were always more people that were better at it than i was and uh, that you kind of expected to 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 um Win, but I mean, I think learn about dogs, get into a kennel, find out what a uh, tough job it is to run a dog and keep them in condition. And we had so you know, we had quite a big kennel in Sweden and even in England. And and we had all these people who wanted who thought it was working in a kennel that was patting dogs on the head, you know. Yeah, exactly. And when they found that they had to scrub kennels and pick up after them and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, realized that this probably wasn't for them. So, I, but, uh, and I think I'm, I'm very, I, I worked for nothing um, in a poodle kennel three summers. And then when I was studying for my, uh, what do you call it, admission test for university, I was in Oslo and, and worked full time with a poodle kennel. So I, altogether I worked over a year with poodles. 
but I worked for nothing. I didn't get paid. It was just my desire to, to be with and work with dogs. And, and the scary thing is that when I wrote to breeders in Sweden or in, in England, we had very few breeders in Norway, the kennels are big enough. You know, there was a waiting list for people who want to come and work there during the summer in the 60s. You have to beg them now. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it's such a different scenario. And, but also, you know, the fact that you came into, and, and I feel so privileged to have met all these people and made them my friends over the years. You know, I can give you a whole list of names that, that have influenced my life in, in uh, uh, so many ways and that I'm eternally grateful for that I did meet. And, and uh, I don't think they'll ever be replaced. Maybe you're getting too old. But I also think that what you learn when you're young, that's when you learn, that's what you remember, that's what stays with you. Yeah, you, you know? Sponge then, I think. So I think that start early, and I think I always envied all these people in both England and America who were second or third or fourth generation dog breeders. Because I, in, nobody in my family even had a cat. You know, I had an aunt who had a min pin who was named Minnie, or my mother's aunt actually, who bit everybody, and that was the only dog in the family. So when I got in, they thought it was, well, they probably were right, they thought there was something seriously wrong with me. Yeah. <laughs> and and um, so I had to really to fight, I didn't get any support for anything. I had to make guests to, 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 to save up to go to dog shows, and, and uh, because they thought it was a totally waste of time. I should rather go to Sunday school. Well, I'm glad you did what you did. What about um, advice? <laughs> <laughs> what about advice for judges, new judges? I think that I I can only say what I, I I think myself is right. Is that you know I whenever I I give a talk about terriers, I always say. This you know we have you know wires fox terriers and lakelands are related. They are. If you go back in their pedigrees, you can find so many find so many similarities. And I always say that really and truly, if you could line up a cutout of the eyes of a Lakeland, a Welsh, and a Wire, an Irish, and an Airedale, and you are able to identify them, then you then you should qualify to judge them. If you see what I mean, you should be able to see their because they have totally different personality yes. and they have a totally different way of looking at you. And, and uh, if, you can, if you can see their expression, you can also uh, see their temperament and attitude to everything. And, and, uh, but of course, a lot of people think that's exciting. But on the other hand, and I have the same with Spaniels because you know, I was, had a lot of wonderful mentors in Spaniels. I had, Jimmy Kudworth and Mary Scott in, in Springers, and I had all these um, cocker ladies that, um, uh, with the big and the Maribone and, and La Granza and all, all these famous kennels that I played by my visits from time to time. And, and um, you should also buy, know the background of these breeds so you know what's important, what is the difference between an a field spaniel and 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 a, and a, and a springer spaniel or a cocker spaniel and and when I grew up in in Norway, there was a number of English cockers that looked like field spaniels actually written. So, um, but an an advice to a judge is that make sure you know what you're talking about before you enter the ring. You shouldn't do it just because you have um, have done a seminar or whatever it costs or and do, done all these tests that you have to do here. I think if you have, I mean, one thing that I've always argued in this country is that all these handlers and assistants who have spent half their life at dog show with dog people of all breeds, they don't get enough credit for the, the background they have. You see what I mean? Oh, I, agree. I agree. Because, and I mean, you work for the American Kennel Club in the office, and when you leave, you get a group or two, depending on how long you've been there. And then if you have worked your whole life as a, as a um, handler, we have a wonderful lady in California who has shown dogs her whole life. 
and uh, one of the best dog people I've ever met. Um, when she retired from handling, they gave her 12 terrier breeds. And there was even a, a campaign for, for uh, signatures for, for, for the AKC to give, give her the group. But, uh, and I think there's rhyme and reason, if you see what I mean. There's, uh, if you have, have spent five days a week at the dog show and then the rest of the week at home working with the dogs, um, if you have learned, you can't make that up by sitting listening to one person for half an hour at the ringside. So all these people run around with a clipboard and say, can you mentor me for... And I said, oh, only if you can watch the whole class or the whole breed. Because, you know, you can't... You don't, watch, you don't learn anything from watching specials. You have to, you have to watch the lower classes to be... Yeah, but uh, we, are all, we, are all, we are all different and different ambitions and it's never been my, I've never been, judging has never been my main object. I've always loved dogs and I love to work with them and I love to breed them and I love to train them. And um, my, my book gave me the biggest kick was when you had a dog that you actually brought into the ring for the first time at six, seven months old, and they were shining. You know, if you see what I mean, they loved it. And, and uh, so that, that, that was payback for a lot of hard work, and uh, that was fantastic. But it um, doesn't always work like that. No. Are there any dogs that you, I don't want, I don't want current dogs that you are being shown right now, but dogs in your, in your past that you've watched or judged that you wished you could have been a part of or had more to do with, or was just excited to see them? And any of those no, but yeah, I mean, I think whenever I, people ask me, which dogs do you remember um, from the past? Um, I always say the two same dog because nothing has happened. Was a bearded collie called Edinburgh Blue Bracken, who won Best in Show at Windsor 1974, I, I think. Dog. Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, the reason I remember him was he was standing like a statue. And just when I came over, he looked at me like, yes, I, in, in, in a way that you, you, he was so dignified and, and so... A bearded collie dignified. <laughs> yeah, he was seriously. And he looked at you as though you were, I won't say a piece of, but, but uh, there was the way he, I can't, he had this, radiance about him that yeah. that was something he, he knew and, he was better yeah yeah and the other one was um when when tim brasia went around the big ring at westminster we run riff a ruffian yeah and, um, and um which gave me goosebumps but it's you know that's a, and of course um, scarf michael the carry blue was another dog that that uh, was very impressive and in wire fox terriers i think for me it's uh um, match between uh, Paddy, I showed him in England a couple of times, you know, um, Gals of Excellence, oh, Paddy. And, um, and King Arthur, that one oh, so much here last year. I love that dog, you know. Yeah. He, I happened to give him a group fourth uh, at, uh, at um, the National or the day after the National. And everybody expected him to win. But, you know, they have, all have days and that's what I think is so important. That to me, a terrier has to perform. Otherwise, it doesn't matter what, what they look like. You, they have to be terriers and they have to want to do what you want them to do. I agree. So, um, well, that's, that's it. But, but um, that's, you know, it's, it's very hard. You know, you feel you're very blasé when you say that you've seen all these millions of dogs and then it's hard to pull out a few that you that really make your hair stand up. But, but, uh, and, but then you have also a lot of big winning dogs and you look at them and say, what do other people see that I don't see? And that, that is what makes this game so fascinating. And I, I'm, I, I was fortunate enough to become very good friends with, with Bob Forsythe. And we played golf more or less five times a week the last four or five years he lived. And, um, Janie also initially, and and um, I remember we were sitting with Janie and Mike Billings one time, and he talked about do-overs, you know, and and all that kind of stuff, and how 
they can went out to the ring and say, what the hell did we do, do what we just did? And I think that happens to everybody that you have a moment when, when you realize you should have done something else and you realize it immediately when you've done it. But, um, and I'm, I'm worried, what I'm worried about more than anything is that I get caught up in details, particularly in my own breeds. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's, it's more apt happening in your own brains because there's things that you... Yeah, and that's also one thing that I was going to say that, that when, when you have this thing about that I want terrier people to be able to, other people, terrier judges to be able to identify the difference between the different breeds and then you wonder yourself, how many breeds am I able to do that with that I'm judging of all these hundred breeds or whatever I do. Yeah. Uh, and, and, but then on the other hand, you also know that even within your own breed, there are experts who have totally different views of what's right and what's wrong. So, um, yeah, it's all true. It's it ain't easy. I don't think. Do you well, think it's easy? I think you can learn from all these people, though. I, I, I uh, like I, I'm an Irish setter person, and I, I tend to. There are so many different styles throughout the years that, but they've all they've all influenced me. So it's, it's and they yeah, all you know, I, 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 I happen to speak with, what's his name, L.C. James in England, the Wendover guy, mm -hmm. and, and, and um, he told me what, and, and if you see the dogs they were showing compared to what you're showing here today and what you see in England today, that's a lot, a lot, a lot of difference. Oh, for sure. But there's pieces. I always found, like, I always found in England that their shoulders and head planes were always better than ours. Back, back when I was, my parents were mm -hmm. Dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, now we would have a little bit our dogs were a little fancier but i thought it was important to we brought a we brought a bitch in from england i can't remember where she was from but she was almost like a repair shop you know what i mean we could take this fancy dog and this bitch could repair what was wrong with him and what she produced <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and still keep that essence that we liked about the fancy dog but she would repair mm -hmm. the problems that he had and I really, I, I like to be able to keep, when you think about type wise, I like to be able to keep those different things in mind when I'm thinking about looking at Yeah, and, and, and that's also one thing that it has been such a subject of discussion of what defines type. Right. And I think to me, type is basically an abstraction. You know, that is, it is hope things are put together, but the result is, an, is something you feel when you see, particularly when it comes to your own breeds. And, and I'm hopeless when, you know, I have friends in my pet hate in any breed are light eyes because I, I know how difficult it is to breed, breed out. And for instance, for the terrier breeds, if you have light eyes, you lose your soul. And, and, and um, so immediately when a dog comes in and, you know, it's, it's out, you know, and I think maybe that's wrong, but, but I know myself from experience how difficult it is to get rid of it. Oh, I, 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 I can understand that completely. I have, I have things about my breeds that if they walk in and I have them, I can't even look at them. So. No, and, but you know, one thing that I think is so interesting in this country is that here you have people telling you all the time that we are evaluating breeding stock. When we were in Scandinavia at the judging seminar in Norway, we were told, remember, you're not psychic. You are not saying it. You are judging the product, not not the potential. And I think that is a lot of truth in that. Actually, oh, yeah, that's a good, good way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, and you know, and particularly when it comes to terriers, where there's a lot of things have been arranged or rearranged. You know, it's uh, you don't know until you breed them or whatever so, <laughs> so but, okay so I, it's the, yeah and one last question for you i've kept you long yeah. um if you had if you could meet the 20 year old gear what advice would you give him go back to school <laughs> 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 no that was when i was at the height of my interest and something like that and it's what i think is so amazing when we, when I traveled around England to all these breeders uh, who had been in dogs for ever and ever and ever, and, uh, 
And I was 19, 20 years old. I knew it all. I tried to tell them, give them advice, and 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 um, and I'm today. I'm embarrassed by it because you realize the longer you're involved here, the longer you you you, you know how little you know. <laughs> and and um, I think it's the same with with the dog world. I said, well, my favorite slogan is, "I've never met a great man who thinks he's great. I've never met a little man who knows he's little." metaphorically speaking and that is the truth you know in, and i think it should apply to all judges that they should be humble and and uh, and i one thing that i always have reacted when people come and thank me for a win which is of course very polite and very nice and i feel more obliged to thank them for coming because if i really like the dog I, i'm the one who's had the pleasure of seeing this animal and and uh, they have won because they have earned it. So that's probably nothing to thank me for. But they should rather I should rather thank them for giving me the opportunity to let them win. So, um, but that's my special. But I, I seriously think that growing up in in a country like uh, or countries like Scandinavia, we were all a bunch of amateurs. We didn't have any professional people. We hadn't got any professional judges. We had a it was all a, a weekend thing when we, you know, we traveled together, we partied on Friday night and Saturday night and went to a dog show and, and um, then drove back home Sunday night. And, and it was very laid back in a way that it was so different from, from the way you do it here. But um, the level of presentation and handling and all the content you see here, you don't see that anywhere else. If you watch Crufts videos from the groups and best in show at Crufts, you realize that there's a lot of difference between Westminster and Crufts when it comes to handling and presentation. And um, I always say that when you judge dogs in America, they are served to you on a plate. You have to find the faults, right? Because they are so well-groomed in most cases. If you, people show dogs to you, particularly in some European countries, you have to find them, you know. It's it, it's because presentation is not at all the same level, and and uh, the way they are presented and the way they handle and all that kind of stuff is so totally different. So in many ways, I think it's easier to judge in this country than it is to judge in some of these other countries because here the dogs are giving the time and opportunity to show themselves off to the best of their ability. And they're served to you. I like that. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right, Gary. Well, I appreciate your time. It was nice to see okay, you. Okay, thank you very much. Nice seeing you. A nice talk. Thank you, Gare. I really enjoyed our time together. If you like what you're seeing here, make sure you press the like, share, and subscribe button. If you want to get a hold of me, get a hold of me at dogshowtips at gmail.com. Or if you just want to find out what's happening in Will's world, go to willalexander.net. Until next week, guys.